Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street partner with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across the globe to develop community organising strategies and train leaders to build power from within their community. And in 2021, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to share their stories, inspire others, take action and give hope and organise communities for change. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Socially Democratic is also presented to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Are you passionate about providing access to justice? Morris Blackburn, Australia's leading plaintiff law firm, is looking for an associate to join their employment and industrial law law team on a full-time permanent basis. Uh, You'll use your legal technical knowledge and expertise to strive for fair outcomes for our clients or for their clients. Jeez, Stephen, you're really stuffing this read up today. Um, The role is based in Melbourne. And to apply, go to morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash careers. That's morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash careers. Be part of change and fight for fair. Apply now. Definitely do that. Sounds like a fantastic job. Hello and welcome to Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that dives into the progressive campaigns and issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And we're just getting on the M1 and driving down to uh, the lovely federal electorate of Bruce in Melbourne's southeastern suburbs to talk to the Labor member down there, Julian Hill, to have him on the show today. We're going to talk about COVID and vaccine rollout and stroll out and all the other crap stuff that the Tories have completely botched. Uh, So Julian's going to come on and share his thoughts on all of that. And don't forget to... Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. And if you if you like the show, let us know by leaving us a review on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. And for all updates about the episodes that are on the internet, follow us at Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Okay, let's get to today's episode. Okay, we're taping this one on a Friday morning in free Melbourne, finally. Uh, and joining me on the line from uh, the great city of uh, Melbourne is the federal member for Bruce down in Melbourne's southeastern suburbs, uh, Labor's Julian Hill. Welcome to Socially Democratic. G'day, mate. Good to be here. Uh, this is our fifth lockdown in Melbourne. We're all becoming experts at it. Um, I'm just wondering what's has what has become your lockdown routine that uh, that gets you through the uh, the experience of being sort of restricted to your home for a long period of time. Uh, as much variety actually as I can manage to shove into a fairly monotonous routine. Uh, so mixing it up, I'm one of those lucky few, I suppose, in that. I am able to, and indeed, indeed at times, have to go to the office. Electorate offices um, are open and still expected to serve people. You know, it's still a democracy. Um, so I do a bit of work at home, a little bit of work at the office, uh, and as much in between. It is one of the things that I've always uh, had in my life and actually love about this role is the sheer diversity, the moving around, the seeing different people. So that's one of the most difficult things uh, to miss uh, during the pandemic. But I do have to remind myself that overall I'm lucky. I've got a role that I love. I've still got an income. Uh, and despite all the frustrations and we're all human, our resilience gets tested, particularly the uncertainty and not being able to plan. Um, but overall, I'm doing okay. Um, let's talk about the, um, the COVID and everything that's sort of dominating the news at the moment. Um, and I want to start with uh, the New South Wales outbreak and get a sense of your thoughts um, on where that's playing out. Obviously, as I said at the top of the episode, Victoria and South Australia came out of their respective lockdowns um, earlier this week. Um, and there were, you know, outbreaks that were connected to New South Wales. Obviously, in in, in, in Sydney in particular, it's, you know, the, the numbers are growing daily. Uh, and for Victorians that went through last year's longer second lockdown, this seems to be like a very familiar story that we're watching here again. Um, it appears to me that both Premier Barry Jiglian and also Prime Minister Morrison are dedicating a lot of time, um, not dedicating a lot of time, I should say, getting on the phone to folks like Daniel Andrews and saying, okay, how exactly did you manage to get on top of a significantly large outbreak, but spending most of their time 
on the phone background into journalists and undermining each other. Um, how do you see this playing out over the next few months? You're right. There's a particular sensibility, I think, for Victorians. Um, we're all amateur epidemiologists now, given what we've been through over the last 12 months, particularly the harshest months of last year. Um, and there's there's a horrible sense of deja vu uh, watching some of the debates and the sort of debacle in Sydney and the New South Wales government's response as well. Um, there's also a lot of trauma, and this is this is an issue, I suppose, that I. Uh, became con even more conscious of a couple of weeks ago at the start of this most recent Melbourne lockdown, you know, another couple of weeks, there was real uncertainty seeing those numbers grow and it brings back to people that sense of um, despair and hopelessness and worry that many people felt through the three months last year. So I think there's a lot of empathy um, for our friends in Sydney. People are reaching out, you know, they are kind of talking about it a lot. Um, but there is also that just sense of incredible frustration watching um, the train wreck of the response, the dithering around, the pandering to big business, the lack of leadership and determination, and Morrison not knowing which way to jump because his old playbook of just taking pot shots at Labor states and trying to blame state governments for his own failures um, wasn't going to work. So, you know, make no mistake, Sydney is a true national disaster. It is a national emergency. It's a quarter of or over a quarter of the Australian economy and population. And the trajectory looks awful. This is almost a never-ending lockdown and it's far too late to avoid the death and the sickness and disease that we've already seen and for businesses and livelihoods, but also for the people's mental health, the family violence epidemic that will emerge again and so on. Um, but despite all of that despondency, we actually can't give up. We have to keep focused on the two jobs that Morrison's continued to fail on, vaccines and quarantine, fixing the hotel quarantine system, which led to this latest mess, because um, they're our way out. Um, there seems to be a common denominator that links these two Liberal leaders, um, and that is that um, politics seems to be guiding their response to this outbreak and not health advice. And one of the things that I think that came very was very consistent from uh, Premier Daniel Andrews all through last year, and I think it dumbstruck the media and i don't think they either believed him or got it because a lot of times the commentary was saying this is bad bad politics for daniel andrews and the premier would stand up at press conferences every day and go i don't give a stuff about the politics i'm just trying to do the right thing by the people of victoria and listen to the health advice and make the right decisions it may not be popular but i think this is the right way forward for us to get out of this mess but north of the border i don't think that's happening i think that they are being guided by the politics and being whipped by uh, the Daily Telegraph and, and trying to create media responses to the work that they're doing. Is that a fair assessment? Um, yeah, I think so in part. I'd, I'd make a couple of points. Firstly, the real gift that Daniel gave Victorians and the leadership qualities he showed, first and foremost, is he actually had a goal and then he put strategies around that goal and determined leadership to get there. He had a goal of getting back to zero. He was very clear on that even when everyone was telling him it wasn't possible and Morrison was running this rubbish live with COVID line in an unvaccinated population. Now, live with COVID uh, at that point and still now is not a nice three-word slogan. It's, you may as well say, mass death. That's actually what it means. So Daniel had a goal and he had strategies and it's in that context that he then listened to the health advice. Um, I do think we need to remember that political leaders... Uh, are actually accountable and they make judgments based on the health advice, uh, but also taking into account, you know, the economic circumstances and their capacities and capabilities and community support and so on. They can't abrogate that responsibility. So I just do make that point. We're not contracting out the job of political leadership to chief health officers. They're the chief advisor, but the leaders are accountable. And I think people get that mixed up sometimes. Um, but, yeah, Daniel didn't give us stuff about electoral popularity. I think that's what he meant by politics. Mm. What we've seen in New South Wales um, is just a, most, a manifest failure of public administration out of leadership. Um, the government is split up there, and that is a big difference uh, between uh, the government that Daniel le leads and what we've seen in New South Wales. There's a hard-right cabal in the Liberal Party that, frankly, have been pushing this Boris Johnson line a libertarian line of just let COVID rip, let, you know, live with COVID, it's all too hard. Um, and a pandering to big business, you know, the, the archetypal nonsense we saw was, why, you know, why have you got your Gucci stores open in a pandemic? Why is Ikea still open? You know, the, the big business lobby are on the phone to the hard right of the New South Wales government saying, don't shut us down. 
Um, it's not our problem. So there's, you know, that's a, that's a big difference between Victoria and New South Wales. Our government, our Labor government was united. The Libs are all over the shop. Um, but Gladys was also boxed in, I think, as a victim of her own uh, hubris. Uh, and also it revealed, you know, this is the truth about a lot of this stuff, there's good management, but there's also good luck or bad luck. And I think what we've also seen is that Sydney had had a run of um, very, very good luck with previous outbreaks, not just their physical geography, but, you know, your first three few people in your chain of transmission, like a several epidemiologist now, um, were they a super spreader? Where did they go? Did they go to the footy? Did they go out nightclubbing at three bars and a couple of, couple of sort of nightclubs? Um, all of those things are beyond the control of any government. We had a lot of bad luck. We had the South Australian hotel quarantine outbreak. Sydney had some good luck. Um, so I think, you know, there is a fundamental difference, but we're so lucky to have had the strong, clear leadership of the Labor government down here uh, that didn't uh, let electoral popularity deter them from their course. Talking to some friends that uh, that are in uh, parts of the um, Andrews government, and one of the things that they're finding interesting at the moment, and to be fair, I haven't watched many of the press conferences this week uh, in New South Wales, um, just for work commitments and whatnot, I'm finding interesting that the, the, the New South Wales media aren't asking questions of the government about what the restrictions they're putting in place in regard to open industries. So that's that sort of food supply chain that needs to be open because they need to feed the mouths of their citizens. Um, the, the experience that I've been told from the second Victorian lockdown was that the government managed to sort of sit down with those industries and work in tandem with them about how, because that was where a lot of the outbreaks were happening. They were like, well, we need to keep on feeding everyone, but we have to put in measures that ensure that we protect uh, the workers in those industries at the same time so they can do their job and also not contract the virus and spread it. So things like workplace capacity restrictions, um, operating in shift bubbles, compulsory PPE, a ban on carpooling, like daily deep cleaning, uh, ensuring workers can't work across multiple sites, and if they if they if they do have another job, that the government would provide fi you know, some financial support for them, temperature testing, surveillance testing. You know, there's a whole heap of things that they did. No one's asking that question. And also, the second thing that well, I didn't know about this either. When we all came out of lockdown, when all residents came out of lockdown last year in Victoria, the restrictions remained in place longer in those industries, and it took a while for those to be lifted. And I think that was the secret to getting on top of the big spread in Victoria. And I don't think the media have, I don't think the media are aware of this or have an interest in asking questions of Gladys on that. So the level of detail that would come in, and I do take your point, we've all become armchair epidemiologists. And I'm so proud I can say the word epidemiologist on a podcast now. I never <laughs> I stayed away from it for a long time. Um, you know, why is there not folks getting on the phone, for, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's happening, I don't know, but I just don't get the feeling that there are people in the New South Wales government getting on the phone to the other states and saying, all right, can you give us a hand with this? How do we handle this? Yeah, it is a bit of a mystery. It makes your head explode some days watching it. But uh, I think three three points. The uh, One of the criticisms, which was so unfair and just ridiculous of uh, how Victoria handled the, the large outbreak last year, they kept saying that the lockdown is just a blunt instrument. It's just a blunt instrument. That's just... Not true. It was actually incredibly detailed and surgically calibrated, as you say, sector by sector, to figure out how do we keep essential things going whilst reducing the risk as far as humanly possible. And that was a sector by sector, workplace by workplace approach. So we didn't shut construction down. Um, there was a, a real surgical focus site by site, industry by industry, trade by trade, to figure out the safest way for people to keep doing essential work um, while socially distanced, changing density limits, meat processing, you know, transport, the whole thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't understand why New South Wales hasn't been able to take those lessons. You know, we did the hard yards. We were the, um, the experiment, if you like, in Australia through largely bad luck in how to actually have, have to respond to those circumstances. So um, it is... It is astounding that many of those templates which we pioneered and developed couldn't just be picked up. But I go back to what I said earlier. I think there's a real failure of leadership to have a clear goal, to go hard, go early, and then you can drag those lessons in. If you don't have that clarity of purpose, 
then you're not going to be able to actually borrow the learnings from Victoria nearly as quickly um, as, you, as you could. Um, the, the final point is this issue of caution. Um, it was interesting. I was listening to an interview with Gladys on uh, Radio National, one of the ABC radios, yes, uh, last night, and it it kind of it was astounding that four or five weeks into this Sydney, the real depths of the Sydney crisis, only then were they talking about ma mandating mask wearing outdoors. And it was like she'd had a revelation. Well, it's not strictly the most important thing for um, uh, from a public health point of view, although it would make some difference, but it's about compliance. We learnt all those lessons and had a very cautious approach in Victoria uh, and were very cautious in getting out of things, you know, and perhaps we're a little uh, too fast in some of the recent outbreaks now that we've learnt about the Delta strain. So we're seeing that caution repeated now where baby steps out to avoid a cat catastrophic sort of plunge back in. The, uh, the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, where's Josh these days? Because he was everywhere last year during the Victorian lockdown telling us that we need to come out of lockdown, that we're hurting the Victorian economy, that we're hurting the national economy. Daniel Andrews has stuffed this up. He, he had an opinion on everything when it came to the Victorian lockdown. But yet, we have not heard a peep out of him in the last, you know, five to six weeks since the, the New South Wales outbreaks got out of control. What's what's going on with Josh? Um, well, we haven't heard much about the New South Wales gold standard of late or uh, the Victorian wave hasn't exactly translated now to be the New South Wales wave. It's funny how things change and... You know, if you want a little bit of a giggle every now and again, you can always trawl back through Josh's tweets, or particularly, actually, some of my personal favourites are Tim Wilson's tweets. You can go back there because uh, they haven't aged well in terms of the, the commentary coming from them in July and August last year. Um, look, uh, Josh, Josh is in a difficult position. You know, he's a Victorian, and yet he was out there for the last two lockdowns in Victoria this year, two fortnight-long lockdowns, um, running the line that he wasn't going to provide economic assistance. Um, you know, I went to uni with Josh, and I actually said this about him in the parliament um, soon after I was elected. Uh, and he came up to me the next day and he said, mate, I saw what you said about me. And I said, oh, yeah, I said, you're a nice bloke who doesn't believe in anything. And he laughed. So, you know, that was it. But, but <laughs> that is the case. He's an amiable bloke, Josh. He's not the most evil of the evil on their side. I'll, you know, say that quite freely. He's, he's actually a decent human being, and I don't think he believes in anything particularly except... Um, <laughs> becoming Prime Minister. He's been like that since uni. And when the going gets tough, when actually things get really difficult, Josh just disappears. Um, speaking of disappearing and reappearing every now and then, let's talk about the actual Morrison government's vaccine uh, rollout or stroll out, as it's been dubbed by some folks on social media. <laughs> Um, it's funny, like Morrison this week was invoking the, the Olympic spirit of competition and, and drive, and this week uh, was saying that, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to a, uh, moments of toughness, let's look to our, there are our Olympic athletes to have inspiration. Um, yet it's still not a race. That doesn't add up for me. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, um, winning Olympic medals is not the same as Morrison's Sydney lockdown. That was a very bizarre um, moment yesterday. Uh, but look, Bill Shorten actually summed it up pretty well a couple of weeks ago. The vaccine rollout is a shit show mm. by any measure. We are last in the developed world. I think at the time you and I are chatting, we're struggling to get to 15% of people vaccinated. We should be well over 50% if we look at our peers and competitors. Um, but this is what happens when Scott Morrison says it's not a race. Uh, we're dangerously exposed to the Delta variant now. Uh, we're vulnerable for months to come to more lockdowns. Um, you know, at some point, and I gave some comments to the media recently around this, uh, at some point in the not-too-distant future, we will need a royal commission, and I don't mean that in a great, big, silly, partisan political way. I mean it in the, the truest, most proper use of a royal commission to examine the public policy uh, lessons and failures, uh, and indeed the things that we may have got right um, in the vac in the pandemic response. Uh, but the vaccine rollout surely will be exposed as the most shocking of these failures. You know, we called on them last year to do four to six deals um, to get in place contracts, world's best practice approach for vaccines. But Morrison sat on his hands. He dithered. You know, it was only Christmas Eve he signed up with Pfizer. Five to seven months later than his competitors. It's now been revealed that the government had a formal policy of wait and see that was actually going to be their approach to vaccine 
procurement. Um, at least that's consistent with his not a race philosophy. Um, but Morrison's senior staffers were involved in this wait and see approach. And it's going to raise serious questions for him that he's going to have to answer. You know, how did the government adopt a wait and see approach with something so important? And why did they wait till Christmas Eve for Pfizer? Um, I'd make one other point that even though if you could excuse the procurement debacle, even if you could excuse that failure, which um, I don't and I don't believe is excusable, um, there's still no distribution plan. Only a fortnight ago, he was running around saying, oh, we're not going to rely on businesses and Bunnings. We had a thought bubble that we're going to get vaccinated at Bunnings. This is 18 months into the pandemic. I mean, for all his faults, John Howard, you know, he ran an evil right-wing government too, but at least it was vaguely competent when they made an evil right-wing decision or just a basic, everyday, sensible decision. Um, it got done. But Morrison's now got a military dude in a uniform running around to try and distract us from the complete failure of the vaccine procurement and rollout. I mean, my follow-up question was, you know, how did the government fuck this up so badly? Um, but and you've sort of gone to the, the, the nub of it there. It's also just showed to me how out of touch the they are or the policy makers within their government are when they were when they first said they were going to roll it out through gps i thought okay that's one part or of a rollout i mean it makes sense to roll out through certain gps that's, that would make sense to my mum for example um, but you know as we've discovered there's a whole two or three generations of australians that don't have a regular general practitioner as a doctor they don't get they just don't go to a doctor they move around a lot they just and they're sort of going, well, who the hell's my GP and where can, where can I go? They just cause this confusion uh, in, in the rollout. That surely there has to be. And the, now they're talking about some pharmacies in New South Wales to help with it. It's, and now you're adding in Bunnings. Like, I just think that they're just literally making this shit up as they go along. They literally are making it up as they go along. That's absolutely right. They've missed um, over 20 of their own targets on the vaccine rollout, whether it's relationship to aged care, um, we were supposed to have 4 million doses by April. Um, you know, 50% of the population vaccinated by now. I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. At one point, he's pretty much abandoned targets. He got sick of missing his own targets, so he abandoned them. Then they released that ridiculous document that said, we weren't having targets now, we we're having horizons, as Elbow rightly said. Horizons are something you never actually get to. You don't actually get to a horizon. It's always somewhere over there. You know, it's not the way to run a public policy program. I've, I was a public servant in a former life for many years, and I'm proud of being a public servant. I've worked for Liberal governments. You can be professional. You can adopt the ethos of the public service and try and implement government policy competently. Um, but this mob, it's, they don't actually like governing. They like being in power, but they don't actually like governing and doing the hard work of taking responsibility. Um, you know, we have, we have a lot of work to do as a country to get this back on track. And, you know, in our, the, the first point you made about the GPs, I don't think Morrison has ever fully accounted or explained why he suddenly jumped to the deal with the GPs. I mean, you know, some have said um, that I just don't have enough information to form, a, form a, a solid view. Some have said that it was some kind of sweetheart deal with the GP lobby to put a bit of cash their way. Um and, but he needs to explain why that option was picked rather than mass vaccination hubs, which have been adopted as the workhorse of vaccine programs in most countries. It just seems a lot simpler. And when people have rung my office, as they do every day, still confused, why can't I get a jab? My GP's booked out for months. You know, they're much, much happier when you say, well, you can go down the Sandown race course, you know, they take appointments or walk-ins, just get yourself down there. That seems to solve the problem. They're happy to drive a few suburbs to a big place where they can go and it's well organised. I mean, certainly the experience in the United States, I've got family over there. Like there's, you can't sit down at a, at a, at a, at a, in a public park without someone stepping up and at a, jumping out of a tree and saying, would you like a vaccination? Like it's just happening everywhere. Like uh, my nephew who's in his... It is ubiquitous. Yeah, he's in his late 20s. He was walking down the street and someone came out of a Walgreens and said, hey, buddy, we've got a couple of spares left over. Do you want to get a vaccination and he said yeah sure no worries like it's just and on the other, it's it's a mystery i had that report from constituents i had that report from constituents who um i'd helped get a travel exemption um to go they had a, both the scholarship and a work thing they had to move to the states for a couple of years okay off they went they were nervous they got off the plane without being vaccinated this was a two or three months ago they sent me an email um thanking me for the help that i'd given them and saying, you know, our first 24 hours in San Francisco, we were going for a walk to accommodate to jet lag, and there's a tent, and they dragged us in. They said, hey, would you like a vaccination? We've got five you can choose from. 
literally the first 24 hours off the plane. Um, the United States can do this. And frankly, we've always prided ourselves on having better, more effective yeah. public administration with one of the world's best public services uh, in Australia as compared to other countries, many other developed countries. This is the most embarrassing failure of public administration that we're in this mess. It really is. It's embarrassing for me because I got into a fight with someone at a bar in Dallas in 2008. It was a Republican and I was absolutely winding him up saying your healthcare system is shit. You don't know how bad you've got it. You're absolutely deluded, yada, yada, yada. And if I ran into him again today, he'd be going, well, at least we're all vaccinated. How's your healthcare system going? Like, it's embarrassing that what has happened over the last, you know, five to six months. The other thing I want to point out is the inc- what's your take on the inconsistency with the medical advice as to whether people should take the AstraZeneca vaccine i i don't know i can't work out how this got to be so confusing for folks i mean as a i don't i'm eligible for pfizer here's one good thing about being over 40 um but i (laughs) feel for people who uh the younger generation are going we'll take we'll take a vaccine but just can we get some clarity from our both our medical uh, leaders and our political leaders are, uh, as to whether or not, because it's this confusion is clearly leading to people not wanting to take the thing. Absolutely. The confusion in the community is immense. It has not been helped either by the government's failure for six months, effectively, to put in place any kind of decent public education campaign broadly on the importance and benefits of vaccination and then consistent and clear messaging on the specific issues about which vaccine you should take and what the rules are and so on. In effect, they vacated the field and outsourced public education to that tosser Clive Palmer, um, who's continuing to drop idiotic leaflets around my electorate, misleading people. You, d- you probably should be a professional epidemiologist, really, not an amateur ones like us before we drift too far into this topic. But, you know, the key thing, of course, is talk to your doctor. You know, I'm a politician, I'm not a doctor. Um, but... The, the individual decisions that people have to make about their own health care um, are influenced by the official medical advice, but also their own health circumstances, but the context. And so I do understand why people in Sydney with this out of control um, Delta strain now spreading, I um, mean, ineffective leadership from the government for far too long to actually get it under control why people would be making their own choices to go and get AstraZeneca despite their concerns about risk. Humans are not that great at weighing up um, that kind of risk. Uh, But fundamentally, we should have a choice of vaccines in this country. We can go to Serbia. Serbia was promoting vaccine tourism six months ago where they're actually getting economic benefit by getting people from elsewhere to fly into Serbia. They'd give you a free choice of any five or six vaccines. You'd stay for three weeks, get your booster shot. Good for their tourism. They got their vaccines done. If Serbia can have five choices... You know, why are we being pushed towards one and a half choices still 18 months into the pandemic? You know, Morrison told us we're at the front of the queue. Um, as I said in Parliament, to raise eyebrows, you know, actually what he meant was he was at the front of the queue. But for every other Australian, they were in the long, far queue. <laughs> Very good. Very good. I haven't done a near queue or far queue gag in a long time. I'm so glad you've done that on the podcast. Props to you. Um, what did you make of Morrison's apology? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> what did you make of Morrison's apology uh, during the week or attempted apology? Well, it wasn't real. It wasn't an apology. There was no acknowledgement. I mean, he kind of said the word sorry in the middle of a sentence in a vaguely relevant context, but there was no, no acknowledgement um, of why he should be sorry. There were no admissions of mistakes. He told us in the same kind of paragraph that, but don't worry, everything's on the right track. I mean, I'm sorry it's not going very well, but it's all on the right track. It wasn't an apology and it meant nothing. It was a kind of an apology that sort of maybe a toddler or primary school kid would give you when they figured out that they kind of had to say sorry, but didn't really mean it. And they had their fingers and toes crossed or were sticking their middle finger up at you. It was ridiculous. It was to shut down a bit of media discussion. But even if he'd given a genuine apology, um, he still had no plan. There's still no actual plan to get the rollout back on track. He's now talking about Christmas as if somehow that will excuse the failings of the last six months and the next five months till Christmas. What's his media strategy? We, like, we don't see him for five weeks uh, and then all of a sudden he's running random, randomised press conferences in, the last, you know, in this last week that's coming up sort of, I think they're almost daily this week. Um, is it, I'm getting the feeling he's worried about losing the votes in New South Wales and that's the only reason he's coming out because he wasn't doing this during the middle of our... Um, outbreak last year or indeed any of the outbreaks that's been happening across the country over the last 15 months? Look, his media strategy 
for some time, and it seems to work for him overall in some senses for two or three years, has been with his credit to be taken, usually for the good work of others, be it premiers or healthcare workers or uh, firefighters or whatever, with his credit to be taken up, he pops, um, surrounded by you know a variable number of Australian flags, sometimes people in uniform. Uh, but where there's actually difficult issues, bad news or responsibility to be taken, he disappears. You know, you wouldn't expect me to say that, but I think that's an identifiable pattern that the media have started to cotton on to in recent months and point to. Uh, that's made it quite uncomfortable for him in the last month or so because we've actually made it... Uh, it's become a media story, the fact that he disappears. So then he's kind of forced to pop up again um, in uncomfortable circumstances. Um, but the common threads, and I saw media reports this week that it's uh, in the ABC that it's starting to appear in research and focus groups. You know, people are drawing, um, drawing the lines, sort of joining the dots themselves. The common thread is the leadership traits of this bloke and his character. And people are now linking it back to what we saw with the bushfires. You know, when there was a crisis there, he didn't take responsibility. He said it was a state issue. Um, he hadn't prepared. He refused to meet with emergency leaders who were knocking on his door for months beforehand telling him this is a looming disaster. He nicked off um, to ho on holiday. I don't actually begrudge the bloke a week off with his kids, but nicked off to Hawaii and tried to lie about it and not tell people he was going out of the country. Um, and then when he got pinged, he ran around in a non-empathetic way and didn't take any real responsibility for months. The bushfire mess, that's the same set of traits that we're actually seeing here. It's not an isolated incident. This is the character of the bloke and this is the kind of leader he actually is. He doesn't take responsibility, wants to be in power, doesn't actually want to do the job. I feel like there was an attempt of um, bipartisan support coming from uh, you guys in federal Labor from the start of the crisis all through 2020. Um, and it's not an easy job being an opposition in a moment of crisis and national unity is always incredibly important. Um, but I'm getting strong vibes, not just because of this podcast, but in recent months that you guys have just run out of patience and um, that you're... There's a, I guess there's a change in tone coming from both elbows, the leader, and for the rest of you guys at a federal level. Um, is that a fair assessment? Like, wh where, are you, where are you guys p placing yourself in terms of trying to play an active role as an opposition? How do you get this right? Uh, without, you know, without hesitation, Labor backed in the government at the start of this crisis over 12 months ago in the national interest. Um, Elbow was crystal clear with the caucus. I'll, I'll, I remember that meeting etched into my mind. It was the last caucus meeting before sort of the world shut down in March 2020. Um, and I'm putting words into his mouth, my, my paraphrasing my memory, not, not precisely what he said, but basically what he said to us is this is going to be a very difficult period of opposition the next three to six months at least. He said, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to do the responsible thing by Australia and Australians. We're going to back in the government on national interests. We're going to vote for things that we don't fully agree with at times. It certainly aren't how we would have done them, but we're not going to start picking fights um, with the government on essential measures. So if they design JobKeeper in a particular way, we'll back them in, we'll make our critiques, we'll put some markers down for the future, um, but we're not going to play politics at this moment. It's deadly serious. Um, and I think we did the right thing. Um, Morrison doesn't give any credit for it. He still runs around saying we've been negative and divisive and never supported him on anything. It's just nonsense. Um, I think that was also the right political strategy, frankly. We actually looked like a mob who were fit to govern and people could imagine us being responsible in government. And I'd contrast that with probably, I think, the worst of the worst, the Victorian state opposition down here, the state libs, uh, just a, a, a goon show. Mm -hmm you know, criticising lockdowns, running running effectively an argument that would create mass death, um, running conspiracy theories about how Daniel Andrews hurt his back. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So we didn't take that approach. Um, and it hasn't always been popular with our base, with our strongest supporters, who rightly saw uh, Morrison's character failings and wanted us to be out there every day ripping him to bits. Uh, but that phase has passed. And uh, in addition, the the unforgivable failures in the vaccine rollout and the hotel quarantine system, we haven't even touched on that, the hotel quarantine system, um, have piled up um, to the point where we absolutely need to hold them to account for their failings. You know, an opposition really has two jobs when you boil it down, apart from all the other stuff you do as, a, as an MP. You hold the government to account for its exercise of power, and we're absolutely doing that, and you develop 
a, a realistic platform to put to people to choose and have a proper democratic choice at an election. Um, I think we're on track with both of those tasks. <laughs> As you were recounting your wow. memories of Albo's uh, final uh, address to the caucus before the country sat, shut down, uh, shut down, I was actually then going through my mind about, oh, I wonder how Michael O'Brien did the same version for, for his <laughs> He would have got up and go, okay, um, <laughs> we're going to criticise the government at every opportunity. I'm going to flip-flop on a whole bunch of different positions, sometimes daily. Um, I'll be for lockdowns and I'll be against lockdowns. I'm going to side with everyone else, everyone else except for Victorians. I'm going to pitch myself as the antagonist against the Victorian people. I want you to undermine my leadership over the course of the next 15 months. I want you to have some leadership spills but not have enough numbers to actually pull the pin on it. Yeah, who's Michael O'Brien again? Yeah, oh, just... Yeah, anyway, let's not talk about him because as Daniel says, he's not relevant to my plans and the people of Victoria. So... <laughs> what I do want to ask you now is because you did make the point, hotel quarantine. Everyone was talking about hotel quarantine last year. It was the it was the it was the new black. Now no one's talking about it at all. But I do note that certainly uh, federal labour are not giving up on that because it is a federal issue. It should be the responsibility of the federal government. Where can you make inroads on getting this problem actually addressed? Because this is going to continue to be a problem as we let more people eventually, hopefully, uh, we, we the, the the walls of our borders come tumbling down we start to let people come back home um how how can we get a win on this what, what's federal labor's um uh, strategy around this one it makes my head explode the hotel quarantine debacle um, morrison has given away our island continent advantages you know we have a huge advantage over the rest of the world let's be, let's be honest the fact that if you look around the world we've had overall lower death and lower disease is not as we've seen now, through brilliant management from the federal government. They made a couple of decent decisions which we called for and backed them in on at the start of the pandemic around managing entry and closing borders and job keeper and so on. A bit late to the party on that. Um, but we're at the end of the line. We're an island continent. You know, we're never going to have the same problems as countries that share land borders um, with others. And yet he's wasted those advantages. I'm slow on the vaccine rollout, sure, but the hotel quarantine debacle is the biggest failing. We've had 27 outbreaks. Let's not forget, that's the reason that Sydney's in lockdown now. That's the reason that over half the country was in lockdown just two weeks ago and the rest of the country's on restrictions. Um, he keeps telling us 99.99% successful. That's actually a rubbish statistic. That counts people who didn't have COVID. I think it's about one in 146 ca positive cases end up seeming to leak out in some way. Mm. The, <laughs> He's, you know, if you're a dog or a cat or a horse or even a bunch of flowers and you come into the country, you go to a Commonwealth quarantine facility. It's got the logo on the front. And yet if you're a person, that's somehow the state's responsibility. What it boils down to, though, is politics with this bloke. He's refused point blank to take responsibility for quarantine because it doesn't suit his political risk calculation. He doesn't want to be blamed if something goes wrong. Um, and it suits him politically to be able to take pot shots and blame the, stimmy, prem, blame the premiers for something that's actually his fault. How do we go forward? Um, we need purpose-built quarantine. You know, he's selling this vague promise that, oh, well, everything will be back to normal, you know, by Christmas and everyone will be vaccinated. It's frankly way too early to know uh, when we can safely allow quarantine-free travel to and from Australia, particularly from high-risk countries uh, with new mutations. You know, you tell me what the mutations look like in six to 12 months. The world's not going to be fully vaccinated by then. Uh, and we should be planning for the future. The scientists tell us that there's going to be more pandemics more often. Uh, and if we had some vision, we could have built, or we could still build, purpose-built quarantine, as Elbow keeps saying, near regional airports and good health facilities that could be used also as disaster resilience facilities and accommodation for natural disasters, which are going to increase, be that bushfires, cyclones, floods. You know, you need a bit of vision here. So we're going to keep pushing this, but we may need to actually uh, re-explain it to try and combat this myth that Morrison's selling that everything's going to be fine by Christmas. The, I fear for the Federation at this point in time. That, that was a dangerous answer. That was also partly me thinking aloud, so there you go. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, I, I, the, you think that in a moment of national crisis that um, the, the, the best and brightest come to the fore and work together in, in, a, in, in a sort of a, a united um, strategic way um, and 
you know, to your point earlier about what um, Albanese had said at the start of the at the pandemic, like we need to, we you know, we have to have national unity here, and that's sometimes not an easy thing to do when you're in opposition, when you have designs on your own, we have your own ambition to get into government, right? Um, and I think that at the st- I had um, uh, Michael Buckland from the McCall Institute on last week, and we were talking about what it felt like back at the start of the pandemic. It felt like there was national unity. It felt like that, that Australia was united. This, the, its citizenry and its leadership were, you know, we're all in this together and we all need to support each other to get through this. But at, at this very moment in time on the 30th of July, I do fear for our federation in the relationship that exists between the states and that's not a party political thing in any particular way i think there's been some moments there where even sort of labor premiers probably haven't been seeing eye to eye as well over the course of this pandemic um but when i think back to you know and i don't want to do the well he started at first kind of thing but yesterday was the anniversary of uh scott morrison saying this quote um Remember, we were in lockdown at this point in time. He says, it is clear that the Victorian wave that Australia is now experiencing, and that's how I honestly have to describe it, I mean, there's not a second wave that's going across the rest of the country. That's not occurring. Um, At a moment when uh, our nation needed to be united, he was the guy that leads our country that was driving wedges between us all. And that in itself is is a massive failure in leadership. Um, and I just worry about where we're... If he, he was doing that then, uh, what does the future hold? Because the things that you've just spoken about there, you know, raise significant concerns, I think, for a lot of Australians because there will be more variants on top of Delta. Um, we're not out of this just yet. Um, h- who knows how long this sting's going to have in its tail? Um, and we have a bloke at the helm who is not looking out for the interests of its citizens, either whether they live here or indeed if they live overseas as well, but looking out for his own political hide, and that just shits me no end. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I don't even know if there's even. Yeah, we're not. At I, I don't even know if there's a question in there, Julian. But anyway, just just, just you come back at me. <laughs> Let's just emote at each other for a bit then. Um, we're not out of this yet, and yeah, news news flash. We're still in a global pandemic. Um, uh, real epidemiologists have sort of suggested to me that I've well, spent a bit of time talking with them here and there quietly. Um, They've suggested that, you know, historically most pandemics kind of tend to peter out in about five years or less, but not all. Um, But the outlook is uncertain. You know, it's a trite saying, but it's actually true. Um, It reveals a a serious truth that no one is safe till everyone's safe and we have to vaccinate the world. You know, I don't think rich countries like Australia have still really grasped this, that we're going to have to pay more to vaccinate the rest of the world if we're going to be safe, even if you want to take a nakedly self-interested view. Um, that's the nature of this disease and these mutations. Um, but, you know, to your point, the Federation at the moment, um, I wouldn't say it's broken, but it is fractured. Um, now, some of that is because of politics, although, to be fair, some of that is the very inherent nature of a pandemic where public health responses, primary public health responses, sit with state sit with state and territory governments. Um, so... You know, what the question then becomes when you accept those realities, we're in a global pandemic, we're going to see border closures and state and territory governments focus on protecting the people they represent and they govern, uh, and then they should do a little bit also, you know, being uh, in that part of the national leadership sort of um, ecosystem. But ultimately then it does come down to the quality of leadership and to the character of the Prime Minister in managing this very difficult environment. Morrison's instincts and his character are all wrong for this time. His first instinct, um, remember, right when the pandemic broke out, he likes to forget this, was live with COVID. This is no worse than the flu. He was going to go to the footy. Um, We were on the precipice of walking down the Boris Johnson-Donald Trump route. Uh, But it was the state premiers that stood him up, Daniel and Gladys, and Jacinda Ardern embarrassing him into doing a U-turn at the very last minute and taking a different course. Um, So what we really need from the national leader is a style of leadership that is determined, that has a sense of urgency, that has a sense of purpose, um, and that brings people together rather than reinforcing divisions. That's just not this bloke's character. It's not his way. It's never been his way. He's not the right leader for these times. 
Well, one thing he's doing, he's definitely he's, uh, making uh, Kevin Rudd and uh, Malcolm Turnbull reinvent themselves, and they're getting on famously now. So he's uniting some people, but ultimately against his own leadership at the same time. So there's something to be said about that. My last question uh, for you is, how is the caucus feeling at the moment? Um, where, you know, who knows when there's going to be an election? It could be any time between like August, basically tomorrow and all the way through to May. Um, are you guys feeling like if there was an election call tomorrow that you're in good shape to uh, to uh, to win the next election? Um, the caucus, I think, is very focused and determined uh, and you know, united now. I mean, of course, you know, people have different views on different things. It would be a weird world if we didn't. But in terms of our political focus and determination to see the back of this dreadful government, um, we're, we're determined. I'm actually... <laughs> I'm, I'm actually feeling optimistic, and I'm usually a pessimist about federal elections. I um, always have been, and, you know, survey says I'm probably right. We seem to have lost about eight out of nine with one draw in recent times. Um, but, you know, the, we're also eyes wide open and realists. There's no such thing as an easy election. You know, truism, power's never seated easily or willingly, and, and, you know, I've made that point to a couple of colleagues, a couple of points when they get a bit nervous over the last 12 months, that, you know, who knew? The government's not just going to fall over and give up, even though they're hopeless. So we're in for a tough fight, um, and I think this election, because of the point you made before, because of the the, the fractured nature at the moment of the Federation, um, one of the experiences of, of people across the globe, but Australians no different, and voters, if you put that hat on them, um, is the retreat to localism, our experience of life, our experience of the world, our experience of the dominant news, particularly we're in a crisis moment like lockdowns, becomes hyper-local. Mm. We're confined to five kilometres from our house. We're, we're obsessed with the daily conference from the premiers. And so for the next election, we're going to see even more than normal um, a, a difference in the nature of the state uh, elections and the state battles, uh, the battles in different states. And we're going to see a knife fight seat by seat in you know, perhaps a dozen seats. Um, so 2020 and 2021 will be dominant but by any measure, we also have to make sure that this election is a choice about the future um, and the government's entire record, not just the pandemic. You know, Australia's fallen behind on wages. We've fallen behind on productivity. Um, our health affordability is going backwards. Our education standards are going backwards. Don't even get me started on climate change and environment issues. On all of these things, the country's been going backwards even before COVID and the pandemic hit. So we're going to be very clear this is a choice about the future, but it's a tough fight and it's a seat-by-seat -seat fight. And I think in that environment, Labor is poised to do well because we do have, you know, the age-old thing, yeah, the Conservatives usually have the media and they usually have more money, uh, but we usually have more people. And people and that community connection in a seat-by-seat -seat knife fight um, can make a real difference. It most certainly can. Um, that's something that uh, is very close to uh, my heart. Well, Julian, we thank you very much for your time today coming on uh, the show. And um, we wish you, I think you're heading off to Parliament again um, this next week. Uh, for uh, Yeah, ind indefinitely. We've got um, two on, one off, two on. But um, because of the quarantine, I think I'll, I'll drive up and probably do five or six weeks and then face potentially a two-week quarantine when I get back to Melbourne. No, but I did two of them last year, so, you know, it's OK. Yeah, you're getting good at it. Fair enough. We wish you the best of luck and uh, pass on our uh, support to the caucus um, in uh, this uh, upcoming uh, uh, parliamentary sitting. Thanks, mate. Terrific to chat. Hey there. Thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.